Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Friday, and welcome to TGIK episode 93. Today we're going to be doing another grokking episode, and today's subject is the Cube Controller Manager, which is going to be a fun one. There's a lot, there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about with regard to the Cube the Controller Manager. So welcome. We've made it through the week. I picked a, a suitably October uh, color scheme. Um, it was actually kind of a shout out to the idea of um, reconciliation loops. You know, like the idea of a, a thermostat being the, you know something that you set and like to your desired state, and then a bunch of machinery and temperature checking and all that stuff happens on the back end to make sure that you're still comfortable, you know, throughout time. So I thought this would be a great image for this week's TGIK. So that was really fun. Found it on, T on Unsplash. That's where we get all of our images. Let's see who is with us today. I'm going to be looking off to my left a little as I go through this episode because I have the two screen set up, but this one's actually kind of off to my left a little. So we got Mr. Lamatti with us. Happy Friday, Lamatti. We have Martin Borgman from the Netherlands. We have Josh from Colorado. He's actually out on a customer, working with the customer stuff this week a lot. Um, we got Rory in Scotland. I appreciate that you wrote Scotland and not that other word that I cannot pronounce. <laughs> Good to see you, Rory. Uh, hello, Joy and Amin from Strasbourg and Marco from Milan, Italy, and my friend Steve Sloka, <coughs> who actually just did a, uh, a webcast of his own on some of the changes in contour and stuff. So if you're interested in that, definitely go check that out. I think that was earlier this week. Um, Shahar from Atlanta. And we have Gatine from Ashburn, Virginia, Keith from Ireland, and thank you. I, I like doing them. The, the grokking sessions are, are super fun. I've really been enjoying them. We've got Christine from Germany and Olav from Copenhagen, Denmark, and Sean from Birmingham, Eng England, Shaquille from Raleigh. Got a, lot of, got a lot of folks up in Atlanta this time, or in Georgia, I should say, this time, and North Carolina, that whole area. Amim, hello from New York City, and Tunde from Texas. And he works with me here at um, VMware as part of our customer reliability engineering team. It's a really pretty incredible team. He asked me like a question earlier this week, and I totally thought he was trolling me because it was something to the dude of like, he's like, I have a pod that has 40 NFS mounts. And I was like, what is even happening? Anyway, those of you that know me will probably find that very funny. Um, <clears throat> we have Ganesh from New Delhi, India and Simone from Gothenburg, Sweden, and Yash from uh, from India, and Bradley from England, and Nick Perry. It's good. It's such a great thing to see so many people from all over the place. And so I'm just like, I'm always just, I will always be surprised by that, like every time, you know, like such a great, such a great audience we have for, for, for this, uh, for this series. It's really awesome. All right, well, let's get into it here. Let me change my scene so I can so you can see what I'm working with. Oh, we got Mr. Magoo. That was actually my dad's nickname uh, from Lexington, South Carolina, and Shizamo from Toronto. All right, so what do we got this week? <laughs> uh, oh, very big news, very important news. The TGIK repo has moved. It is no longer in its normal spot, which was under Heptio, TGIK. It's been moved to um, VMware Tanzu, the, the organization. And if you're curious about, uh, if you want to hear a little more about that, and Joe actually did a, um, a blog post on what VMware Tanzu, that repository is going to be used for. That's actually where we're housing a lot of the existing Heptio open source projects, like Contour, Octant, and some of the others. So definitely check that out. Um, that means that if you are a listener or if you enjoy these shows and you actually want to see us do a show on a different um, subject or anything else like that, the place to be is, if you go to, well, let's just go to the old one and see if it redirects, because it should. So github.com, heptio. TGIK. This is where you would have normally gone, right? And as soon as I click on that, the good part is because we just moved the organization over. Oh, nice. So there's a security alert. Um, because we moved the organization over, it just redirects you automatically. So it should be pretty painless for most folks. Um, but what I wanted to point out here was this issues uh, tab here. So if you have an episode idea that you would like to see us do, oh, some of these are actually done. Like this one was actually done. Um, anyway. 
If you have an episode that you'd like us to do, or if you have something like that, feel free to come on over here to VMware Tons News Org, the TGIK repo, and throw an issue into the box. Um, or if you have any other feedback for us, you know, this is a, this is a reasonable spot for, to put it as well. Let's see, what else do we got? So TGIK repo has moved. The CNCF has announced uh, Kubernetes Community Days, which is an opportunity to kind of get set up, and there's more information available to you here. Um, Basically, you can learn more about hosting your own Kubernetes Community Day. The idea being that, like, we want to get people kind of out there and enabled to be able to kind of like spread the word about what is interesting about Kubernetes, what you're able to do with it, what what makes people successful with it. So check that out. There's definitely more information about how to learn um, how to learn about um, both what it is and how it works and how you get started. It's all in here in the event details. Pretty cool stuff. So if that's the thing that you're interested in doing, it's a great opportunity to kind of get involved. The schedule of, of events, for all events um, in San Diego are up, as far as I know. I think that all of the schedules are up. And this means that it's time to start putting together your very hectic schedule to, to determine where you will be and when you will be there in San Diego if you're going to KubeCon or if you plan on attending any of the same on-site events. Uh, we've got some other people checking in. We got. Iman from Toronto and Hamid from Ireland. Good to see you both. The calendar, I've, I've actually linked the, um, the calendar of events for right, right through here. So there's a, a count now there's a set of events for the Contributor Summit, which happens right before um, KubeCon. We have KubeCon. Obviously, that, that schedule has been up for a little bit. We have Cloud Native Rejects, which is a really interesting, pro which is a really interesting um, event if you are unaware of it. What it does, what they do is they basically open their CFP right after, or like the day of, everybody gets their uh, response from the CNCF with regard to their KubeCon submissions. And if they are, and if you were not able to make it into KubeCon, and that has become something of a diminishing return because there are so many amazing talks that they're getting submitted to every year that there's always going to be just, you know, a plethora of really amazing talks that we're not able to make it into the main event. And this secondary event, um, Cloud Native Rejects, provides you another opportunity to submit that talk and get it, you know, and, and get it presented in a, in a, um, in a, in a uh, zero day event, right? So it's gonna be right there at the same event. I believe it's happening uh, Saturday and Sunday this year, the, the preceding weekend. So. Definitely check that out if that's something that's interesting to you. Um, and then we have Cloud Native Security Day, which is a co-hosted event where we're going to do a lot of talking about the security stuff. Uh, I have talks in, I think, the, the bottom three here. So I have a workshop at KubeCon this year. I have um, a talk with my friend, with my, with my friend Nicholas Lane, who used to work with me here at VMware. And uh, at the Cloud Native Rejects, and then at the Native Security Day, I'm going to be super excited to co-present with Ian Coldwater on uh, abusing Kubernetes defaults. And so, all three of those are going to be great. I'm sure they're going to be awesome. So, and there's, and I'm just one of many, 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 many speakers there. So, like, definitely check those things out if you're going to be coming. If you have not, um, or if you have an interest in uh, presenting a, uh, presenting at a KubeCon, the CFP for KubeCon EU 2020 is open. And it will be open. It actually was just extended. Before I think it was supposed to shut in like, I can't remember, but it was very short deadline. Um, so right now it's open until Wednesday, December 4th. So if you would like to get a talk into um, KubeCon in European or in, in KubeCon EU 2020, definitely check that out. Um, I think it's in Amsterdam. Is that right? Yeah, it's in Amsterdam this year. We March 30th and to April 2nd. So definitely worth checking out. I mean, like, a, I think that's going to be like just a really super fun event. And if you get a talk into it, a lot of a lot of companies um, that I've worked with and worked for, uh, if you get a talk uh, uh, accepted into an event like that, they'll they'll uh, offset the cost of going. So maybe that's available to you. I hope that it is because it's an, it's an incredible opportunity. One of our very own like. Uh, I think he's like kind of one of the hearts of the community, Jorge or George, you know, Castro. He's actually got, um, he was actually just interviewed on the Kubernetes podcast. So definitely check that out if, you, if, that, if, that, if you're interested in hearing what he has to say. 
they did quite a lot of really great conversations, um, or, and they kind of dug into the SID, SID Contrib X and how that works, um, kind of giving more information about how to get involved and where and where to go and what to do. So definitely check that out. I think he also talked about the recent steering committee elections, and all of those things are pretty interesting stuff to the community. Uh, this is a link to the blog to, to, to the um, blog post that we talked about before. This is from Joe. Joe wrote this up basically talking about like being at VMware, what we're doing around open source, and what and, and kind of the direction we see it going, and also sort of announcing the, the GitHub, the, the new GitHub organization. And I said, Valero, Octant, Sonoboy, and now GGIK are going to be hosted there. And um, yeah, it's going to be really. This is going to be the place to be where we where we actually get to really like push the frontier of open source and of open source within VMware. So definitely check that out. What else do we got? Saw a really great write up. Oh, there's one more. Sloop. Where is Sloop? Boop. Salesforce put out a project called Sloop, which is a really interesting title, and the title is Kubernetes History Visualization. The idea that you might be able to see events that have happened and recording and the resource state changes that have happened over time so that you can go back and kind of you know understand what changed within your cluster obviously as we understand uh, as consumers of kubernetes understand many of the things within the cluster are um, are ephemeral right so you might see uh, a pod get um killed because it ran out of resources or you might see um, somebody change the version of the underlying container image is going to be used and you're going to see a rolling update of all of those changes. Or perhaps you see a pod loop you know, failing a liveness check and it getting shut down or restarted so that it can become live again. Right? So the, the idea of this project is that you can actually see the you, know, you can see that timeline. You can see how that affected the resources that you're able to select over time. So I thought this was a pretty interesting one. Definitely worth checking out. Um, I haven't played with it myself yet, but I think it's a it's an interesting project and it looks like they've Got it written up pretty well, so um, it's pretty active. Last last commit was about 21 hours ago, playing with the multi-stage Docker build stuff. And so yeah, check that out. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, what else do we have? Oh, and then there's this scalability tuning on test.io cluster, which is a, a pretty interesting one. Now, most of the time we don't really see a lot of people. Yeah, so Robert's actually providing a little more documentation on, or providing a little more information on the podcast. There's a really good talk on how the community on how community works to come behind developers and users as well, which is true. And specifically in handling veterans that are deep in knowledge and those just getting started and don't know, really know anything. And that is a huge divide. I mean, I've seen just this week, I've seen a lot of tweets um, kind of around the idea of people saying, well, how do I even start? Like, where do I begin? There's a lot in this technology to learn, not just from the perspective of like, what is a Kubernetes, but also like, how does it relate to distributed systems? Like, how do I, how do I develop an expertise around distributed systems and those things, right? And so there's, there's always just so much to learn. You know, and one of my, one of my attempts is to get out here and do these things, right? Like, get the, get these things out there in people's hands, and, and, and hopefully, and hopefully they help. You know, get people started. Back to scalability tuning on test.io. I was going to say that. One of the more common patterns that we see is more clusters, not larger clusters. And the main reason for that, I mean, for my part, one of the larger reasons for that is the is the security model, right? Like, um, <clears throat> like there are a number of things within Kubernetes that are kind of ingrained around the idea of providing primitives that would allow you to develop and design distributed systems, things that would want to communicate and do things like self service discovery and those sorts of and those sorts of things and because that's like kind of a primary design of kubernetes to enable you to do that when it comes to um when it comes to some of the more intense security requirements they kind of clash with that initial design and so that's where i feel like we get end up kind of pushing more toward the more cluster or multi-cluster model rather than single cluster large scale model that said i found this article to be very well written and it covers a lot of really uh, interesting information about some of the sharp edges at larger scale. And so if that is a subject that is interesting to you, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, some of the stuff they were getting into is the caching that happens at the API server. Like what, 
you know, making sure that that's actually in a ready state before forwarding information to that API server so that it would actually take the hit. So you see quite a lot of really good in-depth information here around how that works and what they did to kind of like make that um, work a little more efficiently. So if this is interesting to you, definitely check it out. I thought it was fascinating read and uh, definitely worth looking at. And then the last one, which is actually from a uh, weekly report that Josh Burke has put out, uh, and it's not just him, I think it's actually a few people, but uh, Josh has started this one, it's called Last Week in Kubernetes Development, lwkd.info. Let's just go over there real quick, lwkd.info. So this is uh, a summary of some of the big changes that are happening, right? So here's like a featured PR from last week, you may have heard about this one. Rory was the one that actually reported this one. This was the billion laps ticket. And this is the this is the merge that actually addresses it. It doesn't uh, address it by basically limiting the decode size of YAML and JSON documents. Um, but if you haven't read about that CVE, there is an open CVE against the, um, I think it's actually linked down here below. There we go. So this was the report that Rory put out and what is actually happening here is pretty fun. The idea is that um, we, with the API server, accept YAML payloads. Um, you have to be authenticated and you have to have permission to basically to submit information to the API server. But if you, do have that if you do have that permission, then you can actually submit something like this, which will expand the memory and cause the, C the, the CPU load on the API server to climb. And if it climbs high enough, then it starts to do things that you maybe don't want it to do like shut down or, or um, get restarted and those sorts of things. So it's a, a pretty interesting attack. It's not a, a it's not a new one, and, th and that's why the quotes here, billion laughs has been around since the XML days and stuff, but it is a it is a take on that same attack that was um, made available then. The cool thing about this is that the commit, it basically just limits the expansion and makes it so that like when this happens, you can actually uh, limit, the, limit the effect. This has been merged as a cherry pick into, oh, I saw it here. Doo -doo. Yeah, okay, 113, 114, 115, and 116 branches are all getting the fix. It means if you're running 112 or earlier, your clusters are gonna be very much, continue to be susceptible to this. Um, all right, so that was pretty cool. And that's and that's the, the, the thing I was talking about, is like LWKD, actually does a pretty decent job of just kind of highlighting some of the more interesting uh, changes that are happening. And so if you want to be a little closer to the developer news, this is a great way to go about it. They also talk about next deadlines and kind of where we are in the development process of a particular re release of Kubernetes, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, in there, I saw a link to this PR. Let me just kill some stuff here real quick. So this PR, which is a change to leader election, and we're going to talk about this and the API that it references as part of our discovery of the controller manager. And so I'm going to leave this here. We're going to come back to it, but um, that is our plan. So I have the show notes, and what I've done is just copied over the show notes. I think I'm actually even just using the same hack and over and over again. Um, and, and, we're, and this is our, our plan for the day. We're going to talk about the Kube Controller Manager. We're going to talk about the init code, the controller code. We're going to give an overview of some of the, um, of the controllers and where to find more information about the rest of them. But obviously, there are quite a few controllers that are all managed by the controller manager. And so probably not going to get to each one of them in any great detail, but we'll give kind of a high-level overview of some of them. And we'll also teach you to fish, right? We're going to send you... We're going to go through the process of like showing you where you can find that code and where you can learn about what those things are. We're going to talk about um, this really interesting uh, behavior of the controller manager. Kubernetes itself is a loosely coupled system, and that means that um, the controller manager may not be involved in every call that happens through the system, right? The API server definitely is, but the controller manager may not even affect the lifecycle of a pod, interestingly enough. And we'll show an example of that and how that works. We're going to talk about the theory of operation. We're going to talk about leader election. That's where we're going to go back to that PR that we talked about. And we're going to talk about metrics. 
Um, so I hope all that's interesting to you. And then let's go ahead and get started here. So let's actually let's check on our, our chats and see if we got anybody else checking in here. We got Mohammed from Paris, Bogdan from Bucharest. We have Ricardo. Hello from the San Francisco Bay Area. And then we got Robert's comment about the podcast, which was really helpful. Thank you. We got Ramesh Kumar from San Francisco, and Shahar is asking, "Do you think that if, when cloud providers offer containers and namespaces as a service securely, the trend could reverse to developing in big clusters?" I think that, in my opinion, the design. I mean, it's going to be difficult to. I feel. How do I put this? I think that it is a design that fits better within its means. I think that as we add complexity, and this is an experience that I've had over time with a number of projects, right? As we add complexity, we also add um, we also add, you know, latency things like that. Like we have to, we have to, we we end up. I think putting too many kettle and too many fish into one one bucket here, you know, and that and that means that, like the the project just doesn't scale generally, right? We we spend way too much time like, um, optimizing code to support the type of scale that uh, large clusters would require, and fundamentally, I don't know that there's a big benefit to it, right? Like the idea of having a control plane that so that supports within its own constraint, its own ability to support. The number of nodes or the size of a cluster that 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 are that are you know a good efficiency for that code, I think that that's actually the right target for uh, de designing Kubernetes clusters, right? Like figure out what the efficiency for that code is, like and then aim for clusters of that size, and then understand whether that constraint is limiting you in your consumption of a project like Kubernetes, or whether and and whether it's worth actually even pursuing a larger cluster model from there, right? Um, that's the, these are kind of, I think, the important questions. And what I've seen a lot more, and what I've seen a lot more recently is like a lot more people kind of like really focusing on the idea that um, we have to make the user experience above a single cluster, like that user experience around multi-cluster has to be simpler, and it has to basically guarantee that consistency that you would get in a single cluster across the set. And that's where I see a lot of really interesting happening, a lot of, a lot of interesting work happening inside of the space around it. So that was a great question. Um, thank you very much. And Robert, I think, tuned in with some of that very same information. So if you look at some of the multi-cluster state solutions, yeah, yeah we're going to see federation coming along and, and that sort of stuff. I do think, I think that's going to, I think that trend is going to continue. I don't think that it's going to emerge. Let's get into a question that Lamati asked me earlier this week on Twitter. I think it's this one over here. All right. His question was, um, can you talk about these controllers, like what they do, where, where they go, like how's it, how does it work, like what is what are these things and what are they for? Um, and I'm going to. So let's, this is actually kind of broken out that same list, right? And I've highlighted or bolded those that are not, that are automatically disabled, disabled by default. And they're disabled by default in a number of, for, for a number of uh, reasons that make sense, right? So um, Endpoint Slice is a relatively new API and isn't actually um, turned on by default. Or are my audio levels low? Can everybody hear me okay? I can probably turn my volume up a little. I hope it's all right, because I'm looking right at the mic. Anyway, um, Endpoint Slice is a relatively new take, and it's actually a really interesting controller, because the, the idea of an Endpoint Slice is to kind of redo the Endpoint controller, which is already defined within this list, and um, achieve kind of a better efficiency for those things. Oh, I just wanted to hit plus there. OK, so Endpoint Slice. Endpoint slice. There's documentation for this now. It's in alpha. 
this is where the documentation is, and there's actually some motivation there, somebody that goes into the actual enhancement proposal about why this was being done and what the, and what the goal of it is. But suffice to say that it's actually just, uh, part of it is that it's a better efficiency for how to actually gather information about those endpoints that are behind uh, services that we define within Kubernetes. And another part of it is that really um, to be able to support better addressing schemes, like you know, uh, now we actually are in a place where we're supporting um, where we're supporting uh, IPv IPv4 and IPv6. So like in 116, I believe we were deli we delivered on um, dual stack IPv6. Uh, and IPv4, and so the endpoint slice is a part of that magic, basically making it so that, like, you know, everything can actually determine both of the addresses that might be related to a specific endpoint, and so that's where uh, some of that information comes in. If you are curious about endpoint stack, it's actually going to be located in the same documentation here, um, but this controller, endpoint slice controller, is responsible for the implementation of those resources that are defined within the, um, the API server, because if you think about it, like, an endpoint or an endpoint slice is really just our ability to determine our set of running pods and some characteristics about those pods and then put them into a place behind perhaps a service within Kubernetes that will allow them to be consumed by other things. Things like Kube Proxy or your load balancer or your ingress controller, those, those sorts of things. And so endpoint slice is not typically something that you as a user would uh, interact with but a lot of the pieces that we need, okay, yeah, let me turn it up a little bit. So let me turn my volume up a little bit and see how this goes. One second. How about that? Is that any better? Turn my mic up a little bit and check, check, check. It's probably a little better. Well, it looks better anyway on the, on the graph, but let me know if it, let me know if it needs a little more improvement. Anyway, hopefully I didn't blow anybody out just then. Um, so that's kind of the endpoint slice piece, and that's where the endpoint slice controller comes in. So let's go and look at uh, a couple of different things. First, I want to I want to talk about like where you can find the code that digs into what these things actually mean, and second, I want to talk about um, uh, the init control or the init code. So Let's take those in reverse order. Actually, let's do this one first. So we just talked about the endpoint slice controller, and that is located in the package repository underneath Kubernetes, Kubernetes package controller, and there you'll find the directory for all of the um, for all of the code. Right, and so you can typically find like the controller piece that's going to do it. You can find endpoint. You can find all of the code that's actually going to be responsible for this particular control loop right here inside of this repository. And Go, while it may not be the most readable language in the whole world, it actually doesn't do too terribly bad, right? Like there's actually a pretty, it does a pretty decent job of providing you a way of understanding, like, um, of, of, of trying to be readable, of, try, or of trying to be legible. So like when you're looking through trying to determine what a thing is going to do, you can kind of see, like for example, in this code, it's actually uh, interacting with the, the shared informer that is provided by the controller manager and it's pulling back information into queues that, are, that it cares about, right? So it's pulling back information about services. It's going to pull back information about services, about pods, nodes. It's got the endpoint slice lister, so basically the resource that it's responsible for creating. The max endpoints per slice. It's called the endpoint slice because we're limiting the number of endpoints per slice, kind of giving you a little bit similar, to, similar in some ways to pagination so that you can actually pull, pull these things in a bit more efficient to model. And then we have our reconciler. And so down below, we can kind of see like what's actually happening with all of these things, pulling back all of those things, making control, making caches. It's going to start the endpoint slice controller, processing the queues. Doing the sync, but where's the fun stuff? Here we go. All right, so it's doing a set on the label. Pod lister list. 
couldn't list all of the pods for every given service. Probably one of the more complex examples that are out there. So here it is adding a pod, associating that pod with a particular, um, or defining an endpoint associated with that pod, and giving it a pod M, uh, uh, registering it as a pod endpoint, and updating pods and deleting pods. And so these are the functions that are going to either remove uh, pods from a service or from a slice associated with a service or add them in. And so like as we add, as we see pods come and go, we're going to adjust the number of endpoints associated with a given service or just the endpoint API with those pods. But this part is actually probably only going to implement the, the endpoint bit. It's not really particularly concerned about the services piece. That's the services job. All right, so this is where you can find the code. And again, like within the, uh, within the repository, if you go into Kubernetes package controllers, you're going to find a lot of that information here. Uh, so you can see all of the, this, a lot of those names are pretty consistent across the set, right? Obviously, in this case, there's one that has certificates. And here you see the approver, the cleaner, the publisher, and the signer. These are all controller. This is all, these are each control loops that are responsible for some subset of the amount of work. Is the endpoint slice controller similar in design to the endpoints controller? It is. It just limits, it, it, no, it, well, it doesn't limit the number of pods it tracks, right? Because we need to know about all the pods. The difference is that it breaks that data structure up instead of providing an, uh, all of the pods associated with an endpoint, um, or instead of defining all of the pods associated with a service in a, in a single queue or in a single table, we break those things up into so that as we add more endpoints, we can kind of like spread, we can change that data model a bit. There is actually a kept that talks about that. Um, I'm, and I'm sure it does a better job of explaining it than I do. Uh, let's see if we can find that real quick. So if we go back to endpoint slices. The endpoints API has provided a simple and straightforward way of tracking network endpoints in Kubernetes. Unfortunately, as clusters and services have gotten larger, limitations of the API became more visible. Mostly notice, most, most notably, including challenges with scaling larger number of network endpoints. So the idea being that we, we approach this from a data model perspective, right? So since all network endpoints for a service were stored in a single endpoints resource, those resources could get kind of crazy. And that affected the performance of Kubernetes components like kubeproxy and those things that actually care about the implementation or are responsible for the implementation of services. Um, Endpoint slices help you mitigate that by changing the data model and providing kind of a, topo a topological routing piece, which is actually pretty cool. I mean, like, I'm actually pretty excited about this technology. Like, I think it's actually going to really help um, for a number of things. Um, it's interesting if we if we talk about like you know, cube proxy, which is our previous episode when we talked about how like the uh, one of the first things that will be affected at scale is is IP tables because it was really never meant to scale for that. This is one of the ways that we can address some of that behavior, right? We can address like the behavior as it relates to cube proxy, and then you know from cube proxy down to IP tables might also just kind of buy as follow on be slightly more efficient. Anyway, that was a lot of things to talk about for endpoint sites. So this one is disabled by default. This is why we're not going to go through all of them because it's going to be crazy if we try. Um, it's disabled by default because it's in an alpha state. Bootstrap Signer has been around for some time, and I would like to talk about that one as well. And then Token Cleaner, we can go look at the code for that. So each of these things has a control loop defined within that within that code structure. And if you would like to um, jump in there and look at how it works and what it's doing, that's uh, that's where you would go and, and, and dig into it if you want to look at the code. Um, but many of them kind of make sense, right? Like many of them, just by the title, it makes sense. So. Let's back up a second and talk about kind of controller manager and what it does in kind of a more abstract form. And then we'll kind of talk about like, we'll bring that abstract idea down into the detail here around these control loops. So if we, if we back it up to people who are just kind of like coming at this from fresh. Key controller, different. nope, same. I think it's actually the same polling frequency across the set. And that is a ton of controllers. And it's actually not a lot of uh, requests while idle. This will be an interesting one. This is a really good question. And this is going to be more of a detailed question after I get back to it. So 
let's back it up and do like a quick uh, bring everybody on the same page around controller manager. So the controller manager, its job at the at, you know at, at, in an abstract form is to take those higher level abstractions within Kubernetes and make them lower level abstractions, right? And so when you're interacting with Kubernetes and you create a deployment, um, that deployment will uh, create a, a set of replica set or a, a replica set associated with the configuration that you provided within that deployment, right? So let me jump into my, so I have my cluster here. And if I do kubectl create deployment test image quay.io, actually just put this in the nginx. Replicas. So I've just created a deployment, but as most of the people who have been playing with Kubernetes for a little while, um, they realize that's not just the only thing that just happened right now. What happened here is actually a number of those control loops that we saw in that list were just affected by this change, by this, by this representation of a deployment. If I do kubectl describe deployment test, I can see in uh, the deployment that I created, right? I can see like, you know, basically what it is. And really this is like the simplest possible deployment, right? I've created a, a uh, I've only asked for a single replica. I've given it an image. I've, it's made up some labels, app equals test. Um, I'm not defining any ports or host ports or environments or volumes or any of that stuff. This is like the simplest possible deployment. Um, but what's interesting is that that deployment isn't uh, isn't responsible for creating pods. It's just responsible for creating replica sets, right? And that's why we see in the events down below, we see scaling the replica set up to one. It just defines that replica set as well, right? So the new replica set, test D4D F74 FC9, was created by this deployment controller. So as soon as this resource gets persisted to SCD, right, the API server makes... We, we make a call to the API server saying, here's a deployment object. I want you to go ahead and make all of the pods associated with it real, right? That gets persisted to etcd. The controller manager, which has a watch pretty much against every resource in the world, right? And it creates a shared informer. The deployment controller within that controller manager is, is associated or, or subscribes to that shared informer and sees that there is a new deployment object that has been created and that there are no replica sets associated with that um, deployment object. And it does its bit of work, which is to create the replica set. And it associates that replica set object, kubectl describe replica set. It associate it persists that replica set object down to SED. Right? So that is a different control loop. The first control loop was the deployment controller, and its job was to define that replica set and scale it to whatever the number of, uh, whatever the value of a replica set you defined was, leveraging the configuration or the pod spec, or the, sorry, the template that you provided within that deployment, right? So now we have a replica set. We can scale it horizontally. We can create more of them or less of them, what have you. That replica set was defined within the within etcd, Right? And we saw via our watch on the controller manager that now there is a replica set that's been created. A different controller, the replica set controller, is now going to see, hey, there's a replica set that was created, but there are no pods associated with it. I better get to work. Right? So now the replica set controller, not the deployment controller, is going to see that and start taking action on what the desired and, and what the desired and real state is, right? And so the replica set controller reports success. I have created a pod. You've only asked me for one of them and I did it. There's there's now one of them. Right? But this pod isn't real yet. This pod is just an object that's been persisted to etcd. Um, I'm actually curious, like how many people know what happens next, right? So we've created the pod and we've persisted that pod back to etcd. What is the next object within Kubernetes, within Kubernetes 
to see this pod? It's kind of a trick question. I'm going to give you a second because I want to, I know that there's a, uh, close, you're really close, Bogdan. There's one step. Like which cubelet watches for that pod? Bum, bum, bum. Anybody know? It's a kind of a trick question. So the next thing that actually sees this is the scheduler, right? Because this pod resource has been created, but it's not associated with the node yet. It's not associated with the cubelet, right? And so if I do cube kettle get events, I can see that the next thing that happened Ah, there we go, scheduled, right? I can see that the next thing that happened effectively was that the scheduler saw this pod that was created and it did its bit of work, right? It associated, it successfully assigned this pod to kind to uh, one of my nodes called kind worker. And then we see um, the rest of the life cycle for this pod and that's all happening by the cubelet, right? So the cubelet now sees uh, the, the kind worker node is doing a watch against the API server again Right? Again, in that control or reconciliation loop pattern, it's going to see, hey, there's now a pod that's been defined, and I don't have that pod running locally. I better get to work. Right? And it's going to do the work of pulling the image. It's going to determine whether it's going to report back whether it was successful, whether it was successful or not. It's going to create the container and then report back on whether it was successful in starting it. Right? And that whole process from cube kettle run or from kubectl create deployment involved a number of different control loops across a number of, oh, all right, it's a laptop, give me a break, it's all running locally on my machine. Um, it's all running locally. It's, uh, actually, how long did it take? It took, no, it took, all right, it took about a minute. Okay, fair enough. Um, It took a number of different controllers to achieve that running process on cube node, on cube, on kind worker, right? As again, kind of like the high level view, right? The first thing that happened when that deployment happened, right? So the deployment controller saw that the, make it a little bigger, the deployment controller saw that, uh, so I first interacted with the API server and I said, API server, I would like you to create this deployment for me. And here's the spec. That deployment controller, or so the API server then persisted that value to etcd. I have a picture for this. My home directory is such a mess. Blocks. One second, let me find this real quick. It's a really good picture that uh, Joe got me, or Joe created as part of his deck that was Kubernetes as a platform platform. So I think it'll really help kind of talk through this. It's worth finding though, so bear with me for just a moment while I track it down. Boom, all right. I don't think this is exactly the one, but it'll be good enough, right? So here we are, this is me, I'm a client. I'm interacting with the API server. I say, create me a deployment. That deployment gets persisted back to etcd, and, I, and etcd returns a success that has persisted it. 
API server returns a success to the client saying, job done. And the interesting thing is now the, from the client's perspective, I've created a deployment. There may be other work happening in the background, but it's asynchronous for me, right? What happens next? We see the controller manager. It has a watch against the, the API server, right? It sees that a deployment has been created and it populates that informed that informer that um, shared cache, shared informer cache. Um, our, our deployment controller sees that new object, pulls it off the queue, determines what, what action needs to be taken. It creates a replica set. It makes the call to create a replica set and it persists that replica set object back to the API server. So, uh, and then back to etcd. Again, success, right? So now we see a new replica set being created. API server sees that replica set. The controller manager having a watch against the API server detects that new replica set. The re controller manager replica set controller does its work, creates a pod, persists that pod object back to the API server, back to etcd, right? And then the scheduler says, oh, unscheduled pod, got to do work associates the node name field inside of that pod spec. That's what scheduling does. And it uses as predicate some of the other information that you might define within that spec, like anti-affinity, affinity, node selector, all those things. And then persists that scheduled object back to etcd via the API server. The kubelet sees that there's a scheduled pod, and that's actually how that, that whole process works. So it's, like, it's a number of pieces that are really involved here. Right? Been pretty in, a pretty interesting thing. Now, the other one that kind of blows my mind, right, is that what we just talked about was a whole series of steps involved in just getting to the idea of a defined pod, a fully defined pod, that would allow a, a kubelet to pull down that spec and and create it. But what if we could skip some steps, right? What if I didn't use a higher level abstraction? Maybe I just create a pod. And what if instead of actually defining, waiting for the scheduler to allocate what node is going to be associated with that pod, I allocated that pod directly myself. What would happen? Like what would the behavior of the system be, right? Could I turn off the controller manager in that, in that case? Would it need to be running for me to be able to, to to schedule and run that pod directly? I'm curious to see what your comments are. Like, does anybody have an idea about like whether that would be possible or not? I'm going to, um, I think, yeah, exactly. Stack pods do kind of sort of work that way, slightly different, but yeah. Let's see, Kubernetes manifests. I'm going to move con Cube Controller Manager out of here. So now with that, I won't get paused yesterday. I can still interact with my cluster. Okay. I can still, my kubectl commands still work. API server still up. Loosely coupled system. 
Anybody see any controller managers running? Nope. So let's uh, go ahead and schedule a pod directly on a node, right? So I'm going to do kubectl run uh, test image nginx dash oemo replicas one restart never. This is a little black magic, but it's not too bad. What I'm doing here is I'm leveraging kubectl run to create just a pod manifest. And the way that I do that is I set replicas to one and I set restart to never. And then I do dash OEMO when I wanted to add dry run. My bad. Dash dash dry run. Okay. And then that will create a pod, a pod manifest. So let's take a look at this pod manifest. So this is our pod manifest that's been created, right? I've got an image that I've, I've specified. Don't ever do this because it will just use latest, but whatever. You know, it's, it's fine for now. I've got a restart policy of never, and I've got a DNS, a lot of these things that have just been defaulted. So I'm going to specify this field. This is me scheduling this pod, right? I'm going to put it in kind worker. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah, that's what makes it a, the difference between a pod and a deployment when leveraging cube, uh, kubectl run is that. Um, if you do kubectl run restart never, it'll make a pod. If you do restart, if you leave that argument off, it'll make a deployment, which is kind of fun. So there's our pod YAML. It looks fully defined. It's already the lowest possible deployment object. So there's no higher level of construct being used here. I'm not using any pretty, I'm not using any crazy scheduling predicates or anything else like that. I've just specified the node name, which is what the scheduler would do for this pod. Let's go ahead and create it. Apply dash f pod yaml pod test created get pods and it's running and the controller manager is not it's a loosely coupled system this is my point like the neat thing about controller manager is that it is a loosely coupled system or that it represents that Kubernetes is a loosely coupled system. The same thing could be said for the scheduler. If I wanted to do the work of turning off all of the schedulers, I would also be able to see that they are not a part of the creation of this pod. In this context, when I have created a pod object, what happens is a very different flow from what would happen when I created the deployment object. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, when I create the pod, in this case, right? I could actually, that's a good point. Let's do kubectl delete test uh, pod test. Come on, get pods. So it's gone, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna edit our pod YAML again, and I'm gonna delete node name. And this time it'll actually use the scheduler to do it, right? So let's do that. Kubectl apply dash f pod YAML. Pods. It put it on. Wide. It put it on kind worker, and it's running. Right. So in that case, I actually still used the scheduler, but the controller manager never saw it, and it couldn't have seen it because it was not running. So interesting stuff, right? This is a loosely coupled system. This is one of the things I really love about Kubernetes that it's very durable. It's loosely coupled, and that each piece of it is really focused on just its piece of work. You know, it's one of the really neat things about the about the project. All right, what else do I want to talk about here? So we talked about how this is working. We talked about turning off the controller manager. We've talked about static scheduling, which is really interesting. Like, uh, it's actually even really interesting from the perspective I've used it in the past with different projects to figure out how to bootstrap things. Um, all right. Let's get back into controller manager control loops. So we talked generally about how the deployment is created, how that workflow goes. You're passing information back and forth between the SED and the controller manager. You've heard me say shared informer a lot, and I would like to expand on that for just a moment. So who was it? Shahar. Thank you for bringing this up because I, I think this is another really important step or a really important thing to understand 
about the controller pattern in general. Um, we have a, uh, an incredible gain of efficiency when we define a controller manager. Um, let's talk about controllers. I mean, yeah, how do I want to I want to phrase this? We are making use of an incredible piece of, uh, of, of efficiency when we put all of these controllers in the same context, right? When we, when, we, when we go about that, what we do is we create a shared informer that is responsible for presenting a, the watch to the API server for pretty much any uh, related resource. So in, in theory, the controller manager is watching everything, right? Like pretty much everything because it needs to know when to GC pods, it needs to know about volumes, it needs to know about replica sets and root CAs, it needs to know about routes and services. The controller manager has fingers in everything, but it's not in the blocking path for every resource, as we just witnessed, right? Like I turned the controller manager off. And so even though it needs to know about everything, it really only needs to know about that piece of everything that is related to some of the controller work that it's doing. Right? So the way that we go about that is we create a shared informer. And that means that we're doing the watch against the API server in one place. And then we're multiplexing the result of that watch out to all of the controllers that are being that are that are interacting. Right? So if we look at the code again, if we go back and look at the code for a given controller, let's take a look at the uh, cleaner here. Probably simpler. So this is a certificate cleaner. This is responsible for cleaning out those CSRs that have already been signed. One watcher per resource type. Yeah, pretty much. And I'm pretty sure that it would be every resource type in this case, right? So it's like, it's watching for everything. Um, and then it multiplexes out that watch across all of those controllers. So it's incredibly efficient when you think about it, right? Because if, if, I, if I were to break these controllers out, like one controller and informer per pod or per object, that would be a significant load on the API server. The benefit of that watch model is that I will be notified when things change. And if I can capitalize the benefit of that watch model across, by multiplexing the results across those things that care or modify objects associated with, that, with those changes, then it's an incredible gain in efficiency. <laughs> like um, We can have all of these controllers running on the same process and everything's cool, but if we were to try and break them out one process per, or one pod per process, we would see that API server load climb because although the API servers are, are horizontally scalable, the amount of watches that they create, the amount of watches that we create over time are going to you know add up. And so it's, a, it's a definitely an interesting situation. So here, we are creating the CSR cleaner controller. And I believe, is it up a phone? Is it our polling interval? This is how, this is some experience, some constants around like the actual CSR state, like how long they, how long we want to see them impending, whether they're denied or approved, like how long to keep them around. We have the informer, Lister, interacting with that shared informer. So it's actually going to do a CSR informer against that, and it'll interact with that resource. And then it does some business logic, like is, the, is it expired? Is it pending? Is it uh, past its deadline? You know, of the, the business logic around what it will do, and then it takes its action. Like if it is expired, what do you want me, what should I do? Should I remove it? Should I uh, leave it in place? So do all the controllers live in the same pod as the controller manager? Yes, they all run, it's basically like, uh, I think they're all just channeled out at that point, right? They're, they're basically just all different. You know what, why don't we look into this? Because I remember like looking at this before and being surprised. Okay, I'm gonna kick up a controller manager again here. I need to do that. Oh, 
but before I do that, we're going to need to control our manager. And update. What I want to do is I want to add a line that just increases the verbosity of the long so we can kind of see how it's going about its work as it starts up. And we're just going to watch this control manager kick up here. Install Vim. Bear with me. Yeah, go link these channels. Yep, go link abstraction for threats. Yep. Vim, Cube Controller Manager. And then I want to add some verbosity to the logs. Yes. Whoops. Okay. So this is actually a part of the lease acquisition stuff, right? So what's happening at the moment is there we go. So what we what we saw when we first started up in the logs. What is happening? Whatever. When we first joined in, um, what we saw from the logs was that it was unable to start because there was already a lease. And we're going to talk about what that is and what's happening there in just a second. But first, I want to pop up here to the top of the log. And walk through what's happening for the cluster. Now I have increased the log level, so we're getting a bunch of information that we probably don't need. In fact, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just go make I'm gonna make it to move manifest to controller manager. I think eight was too much. Let's go to three. I'm using kind here to actually do this work. And the reason I use, I like it so much is that it really helps kind of like dig into this kind of stuff. So logs. All right. What do we got? This is a little better. A little more reasonable in the amount of data. So here's our log. And we see it kick up, and it tells us all about the flags that it was able to determine from its configuration, right? Uh, like, how is the controller manager configured? I always like really appreciate it when things do this, because it helps me determine if I have them configured correctly. A uh, bunch of information. This basically describes all of the flags that it would be looking for. And uh, it'll determine what it'll, it'll tell you what it determined was the right answer for that set, right? And so in this case, it's using endpoints to do leader election. We'll look about we'll look at what that means. So it's got leader elect set is true. Here's all the different command line flags for the controller manager. 
including its verbose. Um, it generated a self-signed assert in memory for the serving interface. There's not much serving behind it except for like um, metrics and that sort of stuff, but it is, secure, it is securely serving that on 10.252, and we'll look at that interface here in just a minute around the metrics endpoint. Then it goes about trying to acquire a, a leader lease. And originally this failed because it was able to, it, it determined that some other controller manager was the actual leader. And that's probably because as we turned them off, we were actually mucking with the leader election across that set. So we saw, like, we were basically causing it to fail over until we, until it completely failed because there were no more controller managers left. Then we see the success, right? We, we are now the leader, so we better get to work. Right, and this is what get to work means, right? So now we're going to start uh, kicking up the endpoint controller. We're going to kick up the controller. We're going to kick on the reflectors. We're starting up that in, in um, cache around some things. We started the pod GC. We started the resource quota. We're starting the GC quota. Again, kicking up the um, the, uh, the cache for stuff. The reflectors for things. We got the Quota monitor in place. Resource quota is started. We're starting the replica set controller. Starting the disruption controller and the service controller. All of these things are getting kicked up. And we can look at the log and watch them all starting up, right? So these are all just uh, processes here. So now what I wanted to show you before, right? So CRI kettle PS. If I do a CRI kettle and in exec into this, exec TI. The controller manager, and hopefully it has a shell, it does, PSYCF, cat proc C proc. So I have three processes running. The first one is this controller manager process. 34. That's my shell command uh, that I'm executing in, uh, executing with, and then let's take a look at 40. Uh, 40 CMD line. Oh, that was actually the process I had running, uh, chasing processes. Anyway, so there's only one process running inside of this pod, but they're all threaded out. Give me the standby manager run control run control is it all? That is correct, actually. Yeah, uh, the standby the standbys don't run anything at all. They sit there watching this. In fact, why don't we show that real quick? And you guys are like leading me through this. This is so great. So I'm gonna jump into control plane two. Let's see Kubernetes, and then we're gonna do um, move to controller manager to manifest. CR kettle PS, CR kettle logs. What's going to happen here? It's going to keep. It's it's kind of kicked up enough, really, basically, just to tell to just to let us know that metrics are there, but not much is happening. Right? We're not seeing much come in more from the logs. But why not? Like, why can't it? Uh, why can't it acquire that lead release? Right, so it's not. I mean, literally, it is not starting any. It's not continuing any further down the code path than the lead release code, which happens really early on in the process for the controller manager. Right, and since it's not the leader, it doesn't do any work. It doesn't start any controllers. It just sits there in hibernation. But let's go back to control plane one and move Etsy Kubernetes manifests Q controller manager. This would be better to do this would be better to watch like in in uh, in parallel. So let me just kick this up. Let's do split horizontal or yeah horizontal speed split. Okay. Docker exec TI kind controller and CRI kettle PS, CRI kettle P, 
logs dash f the controller manager. So we're, we're following the logs for the controller manager. Yeah, that's true. Canines is really good. I completely agree. All right, and now I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, stop the controller manager on that first pod and see what happens, right? So if I move Etsy Kubernetes manifests cube controller manager to Etsy Kubernetes, then that pod will get killed. The leader election should then open up because it'll be 15 seconds, I think it is. And then this controller manager, which is running, watching that lease election, is going to see the opportunity and it's going to take a shot at becoming the leader. Well, oh, there we go. And away we go. Why does the control manager start an election and elect himself as a leader in that case? Because there has to be a leader, right? So there has to be some logic in which, yeah, exactly, because there's no other control manager around. But it still will honor that lease, right? So let's take a look at what that lease means. Cube kettle, get endpoints, and coop system. So here's the controller manager. Um, endpoint, and you can see that there are no endpoints. This is a little of a mis a bit of a misnomer, right? We see this for the scheduler and for the controller manager. This is actually a pattern that was established like a million a, a long time ago, um, in that we would just use the endpoint. Uh, API to store information. So let's take a look at that. So kubectl describe endpoint dash n kube system kube controller manager. And inside of here we have some annotations. In, in that annotation we can see the holder identity. So we know that right now kube kind control plane 2 is the one that actually has the current running or current leader for uh, the cube controller manager process, right? And w which we know to be true. We see that the least duration time is 15 seconds and that the acquired time or the check-in time was actually, I wanna want see more of this. So I'm gonna do dash O. So the acquire time, and then the renew time, and then the leader transitions. There's been a lot of leader transitions as we played around kicking these controller managers back and forth between each other, right? So at the moment, the API is leveraging the endpoints API, just like we talked about for the for the services and those sorts of things. It's just leveraging that same object model and annotating it, and using that annotation model to determine or to to represent the the, the leader election process back and forth between controller managers. What is the questions here? Let me dig into the questions. I'm seeing lots of feedback. I want to make sure we get these answered. So, doo -doo -doo. the controller managers run inside the the controllers run inside the controller managers as go routines. That's correct. They perform a leader election across multiple replicas to make sure multiple instances are all full in the API are not all full in the API server. Yeah, that's right. Um. I said channels, but I meant go routines. You are correct. So what else we got? Leader election is more for ensuring that only one manager is mute, does the mutating. Well, that's part of it, but it's actually that there, there is, uh, there's no reason to increase the load on the API server if you're not doing any work. So we do actually not run any controllers if you're not the, the main one. I would expect, I would have expected standbys to have an informer chat hot, cache hot, which they do not because it doesn't really take very long. And if you think about it, we're still in that, you know, um, we're still in that uh, um, level triggered design, right? Wherein, even if there is no controller manager for some time, as soon as there is one, it will take the, it will take, it will take action and converge on the desired state. So we're not, we're not beholden to the idea that, um, the controller manager has to be running the whole time. That's kind of the benefit of the model, is that if we kick up that controller manager at any point, 
it will take care of the work. And then in theory, we could actually shut it down. Kind of wow. Um, we don't, right? We just keep we just keep the loop going forever and ever, and continually, continually uh, uh, apply it. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Canines is awesome. It's true. Why does a controller manager start an election and elect himself? So what is happening is the controller manager does a start. It start. It looks at the lease to determine if that lease is expired. And if there is no, uh, if if it is expired, then it puts its bid in, right? And so, if we see that, uh, if we if there if that lease is um, expired, then it puts its bid in. And this is actually how we're doing leader, um, leader election. And so the next guy comes along and he does a check for that leader election value. And if it's already in place, then it doesn't proceed from there. The code won't proceed. A malicious controller manager could totally get pretty hinky. Yeah, I mean, like if you had, if you had, even if you'd started one another controller manager and just disabled the leader election code with the command line flag, things could get fun, you know, because like, which controller manager is doing that? It'd be kind of wild. Um, but yeah, you know, good chaos test. The whole design paradigm with controllers is eventually consistent. That's correct. Well, I, would, I, could, I consider it more like a level set rather than event trigger, but yeah. There is a config map model for this too. I think the API server does that for like determining which. There's actually now even a third one. Can you kind of explain? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, please. So there's a new API uh, that was that came about with the work around trying to solve this problem for nodes, and it's the coordination API. And the coordination API has exactly the same fields that you would expect. It has a status object. It has the API servers and the kind. If we look at the spec, we can see those same fields that we saw before, right? What's the renew time, the lease transitions, how many of them were there, what's the lease duration time, holder identity, acquire time. The benefit of this is that it's a real API. We're not just overloading the endpoints to determine this. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it's used, it's used in 115. I think in 116, that was actually what I was referring to here. In 116, we see this change, which is migrating the lease, the leader election code to use the lease API. So that'll be, so that'll be changing soon. Yeah. We've talked about so much. This is what I meant when I started this episode. And I was like, this is going to be great because there's so much to talk about. <laughs> like, this is like, this is wild. Like, there's so much to talk about with the controller manager and how it works. I'm really glad you guys are, I'm re really glad y'all are digging this. I don't mean to say you guys, I'm going to say y'all um, are digging this. All right. So, back to the list of controllers. Attach, detach, related to volumes being attached on Kubelet. Bootstrap signer. This is one I want to talk about. I'm going to come back to it in just a second. Cloud node lifecycle. You ever get that experience where you have a bunch of uh, Kubelets running inside of like an AWS or what have you, and one of the nodes gets deleted, and you notice that it's not, it's no longer in uh, your kubectl no, get nodes output? That's because of this. Pretty cool. Cluster aggregation, this is an RBAC trick. So within, within RBAC now, you have the ability to define annotations that would describe aggregation of a role, which is a thing I want to do a session on because it's really cool, but cluster aggregation has the ability to help you build an aggregate rule acro across a number of different cluster roles and roles that you've defined, or actually against a, a number of different cluster roles that you've defined. I think it works as roles too, but I haven't played with it too much. Cron job, super obvious. If you have cron jobs running, like that cron job resource that creates that pod for you, and like what, how, you know, when does it do it, that sort of stuff, that's all the cron job controller. Certificate signing request approving. Certificate signing request cleaner. Certificate signing request signing, like the, the work, the actual controllers that are responsible for doing this work. Approving is interesting because it represents code that we can use to automatically approve a CSR. Why would we want to do that? We're going to come back to that when we talk about Bootstrap Signer. The daemon set controller. I think that's right. 
Yeah, I think it's still using the job object. It's just that the cron job part has like a slightly different, uh, you know, the best way to see this, in my opinion, always is kubectl explain. I'm like such a crazy junkie of kubectl explain. Cron job. So here's the API object for, for cron job. You can see it's in v1 beta 1. We can see the spec. And inside of the spec for cron job, we have concurrent policy, field job history, minute, job template, schedule, starting deadline seconds, successful job history. Minute. Many of these things are common across this and job spec, but the differences are also very important, right? So many of these things actually kind of come across, um, but the difference is the cron job is kind of like a higher order one that shows. That, that shows like the timing and that sort of stuff, like whether to start them all at the same time, what the schedule is, that sort of stuff. So it's a higher level, the scheduled job. Thank you for using such simple words to describe the thing I'm about to ramble on. Yes, that is correct. It is a scheduled job. <laughs> daemon set controller handles turning on and creating the creation of daemon sets. Deployment handles the deployment. Deployment calls, all of those things, right? Disruption, this is your pod disruption budget, your PDB. It's actually going to handle that sort of stuff. Endpoint, we just looked at endpoint for many good reasons, lots of obvious things. Garbage collector, there's a number of garbage collectors in here, a number of garbage collector uh, jobs, and so they are each different. This one is, if I remember correctly, wonk. The garbage collector. This one is watching for Looks like it's all resources. More like a kind of a global garbage collection. Yeah, it's looking for like dangling resources. It's looking for things without an owner reference. And then trying to gather them up and delete them over time. So it's basically like a real garbage collector. It's like the big top level garbage collector that's responsible for determining whether things need to be deleted or not. Like if there are pods or orphan dependents, resources that have been created that have been left behind, this garbage collector is trying to take care of them. Pretty cool. Yeah, so again, like if you want to go look at the code and see how it's working and like what it's going to, what it's trying to do, this is definitely the, the path for that, right? So Kubernetes, Kubernetes, package, controller, you're going to find the code for each of the controllers that we're looking at inside of here. So this is kind of like the global garbage collector. We have horizontal pod auto scaling. That's where you actually like might create a, uh, an HPA policy that's, you know, triggering on a queue depth. And when queue depth gets to a certain point, then it makes a job, it makes a it does a scaling operation on the deployment associated with that worker, right? That sort of stuff. We've got jobs, a subset of cron jobs, if you will. You've got namespace controller, which is responsible for um, uh, sometimes the, the automatic creation of things, I think. Yeah, that one probably is. It's the one documented in workflows control. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and that's, I mean, a lot of these things are going to be documented in the docs. I'm just looking at the code. That's a very good point, though, if you are curious about it. Um, if you go to docs.cades.io, it'll provide you a nice search interface. Garbage collection. Yep, exactly. So this is the doc for that particular piece. Yep. 
how garbage controlling how the garbage collector <laughs> deletes dependence. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to knock my camera around. Um, but yeah, like that would be documented here, and you can find that that's actually true for a number of different controllers. Like there is it's the replica set controller. Put all of it here. Well, that's kind of a weird. I was expecting that to give you more controllers. Daemon set job, bear pods, deployment. Huh. Worth looking at, but yeah, I would have expected it to list the controllers that it's actually talking about. So I'll be all figured out how to make a talk about that. So all right, so we talked about these things. Node life cycle, persistent volume, binder, and expander, relatively new code in expander, which is the ability to actually interact with whatever the provider is and like make it a larger one. Pods you see, deleting those pods that are in terminated state over time. Just pods though, it's actually just garbage collecting pods. Um, then we have PBC protection and, P and PB protection. This means if you mark a PB for non-deletion, this is the thing that's going to intercept that and make sure it doesn't happen. Replication set control, replica set controller, the replication controller controller, <laughs> resource quota. All these things are kind of like, you know, in line with what you would expect. Service account, service account token. Um, TTL and TTL after finished are both kind of related to jobs again. And then uh, stateful sets responsible for creating the higher, you know, breaking those larger objects of stateful sets down to smaller objects as we talked about. Now we're back to Bootstrap Signer. So let's talk about this one. because This is one that we actually enable with KubeADM that is not enabled widely. Um, and this is also kind of a fun one to experiment with. Route controller. I believe that is for cloud routes, if I remember correctly. Like it's an older version of the cloud route stuff. But let's go look at it. Maximum number of concurrent create route API calls. Got your node lister, got your broadcaster, cloud provider routes. Yeah. So in some cases, like you had the ability to it, uh, interact with your cloud provider to create routes for um, for subnets that were associated with nodes inside of the cloud provider's VPC routing mechanism. So like within the route table of the VPC, you could actually add a route saying like if you're going to a subnet that's associated with pod one or with node one, then you would just create a route within a VPC saying send that traffic to that one. Thank you. Got that right. That's awesome. Yes. I think that's right. Google Compute Engine. And actually, you know, I think Red Hat did something similar with it too, actually. But, you know, it's, a, it's an older pattern. I don't think we you actually, I'm not entirely sure we even still use this code. Um, I'm not, I don't work for Google, so I can't say for sure. But I don't, I don't, I'm not under the impression that this is all, this is all still used. This is a lot, you know, a lot of this stuff has been moved, obviously, to the cloud provider interface. So I imagine that this is either dead or it's going to be. <laughs> like, one of the two. Um, because it, it certainly doesn't belong in core, right? Like you shouldn't be kicking this up if you don't need it. And you probably don't, it probably, there is probably some gate for limiting that as well. In fact, I thought, inside of here, yeah, include cloud loops. So if loop mode includes cloud loops, These are all three probably related to the same combination because it's actually behind another argument where you specify loop mode. Huh. 
All right. What does the bootstrap signer do? The bootstrap signer is responsible, it's part of bootstrap TLS. I'm going to go to the docs this time because bootstrap, come on now, bootstrap TLS. TLS bootstrapping. So this bootstrap sign, this um, bootstrap signer is is part of this action, and this is an action that KubeADM leverages, and I think it greatly increases the security posture of Kubernetes in general because it basically provides for a unique identity per node, so that you can actually do things like have a better control over when doing things like node restriction. Right, you can understand which node is making the call and what and what um, resources that particular node should have access to, and constrain it better. If they all identify as the same node, it's going to be very difficult to actually limit that, that capability. As part of bootstrap initialization, KubeADM does this thing where um, we, we generate a CSR on the, no, on the node that we're bootstrapping, and then we present that CSR up to the, um, up to the certificate API within Kubernetes, and then the bootstrap uh, signer actually signs that and, retur and returns it to us. And so if you're curious about reading through that, you can see that here it's all documented and it basically talks about bootstrap tokens and the token authentication file and like how those things are created and, 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 and all of that sort of stuff. So enabling bootstrap token auth true is actually probably to do with that bootstrap signer. And then the auto approval, the CSR auto approval is the ability to allow for those CSRs that are issued by nodes to be automatically approved so that the client certificate that the node uses when interacting with the API server is unique per node. And this gets rid of the need for trying to play all those CS, CS, uh, CFSSL things. You can actually get a certificate per node. So let's go just explore that in person a little bit. Worker. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you the certificate that was issued Right, and then I'm going to do, and then I'm going to show you. I'm going to get rid of it, and we'll show how it's being created by that particular signer. So oh, before I do that, though, I want to move manifest to controller manager. Here, I'm going to go back to my one that has more logging. Does the node need a bootstrap token for that? Yes, it does. Yeah. But that's just the string, and we'll, we'll I'll show you that here in just a second as well. So this is the client certificate that's been issued, and we can see like what time it was issued, that kind of stuff. But let's take a look at this certificate. X509 text. So we can see that this certificate was signed by the Kubernetes Certificate Authority, and that it's associated with our a node kind worker, and it even has. Um, So the subject name is our, our name and the group name is system nodes. And this is actually how we are authenticating with Kubernetes when we interact with it, right? So to give you a little example of like what I'm talking about by the better security model, if I do export kubeconfig equals se kubernetes pupa.com, right? That is basically at etsy kubernetes kubelet.com. This is a kube config that has a copy of the CA certificate associated with our cluster, and it has, and it's pointing at the client certificate that we just looked at, the client current one, and the key. And so now I'm going to be able to authenticate as this user, right? So if I do, or as this particular node. So if I do kube kettle auth can I list I can see what capabilities this particular uh, node has, right? And so I can see I have to have the ability to do self-subject access. I can do get against API and APIs. I can do um, create against the self-node client, which is fun. 
right? So I can actually create a new certificate by myself for myself, a new CSR, a new create certificate signing request for myself, but I can't like uh, approve it. I can only create it. Um, but that's what it says is is the limitation. In reality, the there's an there's an admission controller called node restriction, which gives me access to more than this, right? So let's see if I can do kubectl get nodes. I can see the other nodes. What about other pods? I can see all the pods in the system, but can I delete one? The answer is no, right? So it says pods cube proxy uh, 75Z96 is forbidden. Node kind worker can only delete pods with spec node name set to itself, right? This is where that this is where that um, admission controller node restriction comes in, and because it's able to determine if it is itself because of the way that I'm authenticating as part of my authentication mechanism, it's able to determine that I am kind worker. And so I can I will only be allowed to delete things that are known about by kind worker. Neat stuff. So what I want to do now is I'm going to do kubeadm reset dash f, and then I'm going to make sure that it's all gone. Varlib kubelet pki. Oh, yep, it's gone. Right. So there's nothing left in varlib kubelet. And then I'm going to pop over, and I'm going to do kubeadm create token print join command it's probably token create so I'm going to grab this command line which is basically going to allow me to register my worker back with that cluster Ignore pre flight error. I'm actually cheating here. I could enumerate them, right? I could say ignore file content, ignore swap, ignore system verification, but I'm lazy, so I'm going to do errors all. And then what's happening here is that we're going to see it going about the process of generating a CSR. My bad. Clean controller manager here. <laughs> Awkward. All right. Logs dash F. Color manager is kicking up. Hey, there we go. All right. So what was happening there was the controller manager wasn't running, and I missed that. Sorry about that. Um, so once the controller manager was able to actually see it, then we were able to see things like the call to interact with the cluster. We were able to see the um, go ahead and get the kubeadm configuration, and then we submitted a CSR. And then we saw that CSR approved. So if I do kubectl get CSR, 
I can see the approval, I can see the, uh, the certificates that were issued, including this one, which was for myself. And this was actually auto-approved, right? So if I do kubectl get events, can kube system, can't do that because I'm not that user. kubectl get events, and kube system. We can see the approval, I think. Yeah. Good old get CSR. Good old describe CSR. So this has been approved by that CSR approver. And then the token was actually issued, and we were able, and we were able to get the certificate approved for kind worker and in the organization system nodes. And if we go back to our logs, this is what I wanted to show us here. So if I go into here, Uh, I don't have enough logs. Well, I have to increase the logs, the log level to catch this, but it might be worth doing. What do you think? Everybody down for like one more object? Then we'll stick around for, uh, oh, I haven't made the answer to this one because he was just looking at CSR Cleaner earlier in this episode. Controller. Certificates. Cleaner, cleaner. The approved expiration is one hour. So we'll stick around for one hour before it is actually removed by the CSR cleaner. What if I didn't want to have it? What did it, if I didn't want it to be ever cleaned? This is an interesting question too. And the answer to that takes us to new controller manager. The reference docs for Cube Controller Manager. And specifically the list of controllers to enable. So if I never wanted them to get cleaned up, if I wanted to handle that process on my own, right? I could actually not. I could actually not approve. I could uh, get rid of the CSR cleaner controller. Right? These are all the controllers, and I can explicitly say to enable a particular set, or specifically disable a specific controller. So I want anything deleting my controllers. I can um, go ahead and just remove that controller that would handle the, the cleanup. That's one of the ways that I can configure the controller manager. All right. Can be skipped. Theory of operation, leader election. Metrics is left. How are we doing on time? Are we over? 243? We're a little over. We're not bad. There's always so much to cover. We talked about disabled by default. Talked about init code and controller code and control loops. Let's talk about metrics. LNTU, I was command you see me use before SSN, SS Tulip, the SS Tulip, one of my favorites. Controller. How much time, in my sense, in my case, the CSR is an appendix date. We're restarting the controller to approve that. Uh, if you may not have the approver, the approver it should be in there only for the nodes, right? If it, if you have other certificates, other CSRs that you've issued, then that CSR is not going to be automatically approved because we have no way of understanding the authority of it. 
If you're interested in exploring more about the CSR controller, there is a really cool project by Julian Vestra, Velestra, my bad, that I have used on a number of occasions to, to interact with the, the in cluster CA. And here you can actually leverage this tool to um, interact with the cluster CA, provide it the right permissions to allow it to approve the certificate, right? Um, but fundamentally, the auto approver is only going to auto approve certificates that are for the node. It's not going to automatically approve certificates in any other form. Cube CSR, pretty cool project. I'm going to put it in the link. I'm going to put it in the notes here, show notes. Um, reference links. CSR. Right. Groovy. What else do we have? Kind of lost track of my, my brain. Oh, metrics. That's right. Metrics. Do, do, do. Right. So, all aboard the SS Tulip. So, the SS Tulip gives us the ability to understand those processes as they're associated with PIDs, right? So I have my Cube Controller Manager. It is actually listening on two ports, port 10.252 and port 10.257. If I do a curl, minus K, HTTPS, 0000, colon, 10.252, what happens? That is not it. So these metrics are exposed unauthenticated at the moment, which is interesting. I thought that they were used to be secured, but they're listening on all ports. And these, are the, and these are the metrics that are exposed by the controller manager. And obviously, the number of endpoints that we see in the controller manager is always going to be pretty intense, like metrics-wise, because it's doing so much work, right? So it has so much to talk about as far as, like, you know, the things that we're actually watching. I'm just going through this because I'm trying to get to the top. But there's a ton of metrics that the controller manager exposes that are valuable metrics that we want to that we want to understand, right? So here is the top of that list. We are listing on port 10252 and exposing the metrics for all this information. And this information could include things like how many cluster role aggregator adds, the depth, the um, for each controller there's going to be some specific information, right? What the API server client certificate expiration looks like what the storage key data key generation we got bootstrap signer queue we got the certificate queue latency for generating certificates we have the work duration how long it took people to do the work we got claims there's just a ton of metrics for the daemon set queue how long is the daemon set queue like if you issue a new daemon set how long does it take for that daemon set to actually prog progress, right? Um, same thing for deployments. Same thing for replica sets. The disruption check, right? Like all of the things that you would probably want to instrument in that code are all instrumented. Many of them are instrumented here. And if there are things that you would want to instrument differently or in, adi uh, in addition to, you know, open source project, get involved. It'll be awesome. So tons of things, to, tons of things in the metric output that um, actually really have a lot of value in, in, the, in the actual work as it relates to controller management, right? So it will, it, will, it really does perform, uh, it really does provide a lot of information for like, for how the actual process itself is, is operating. So tons of metrics. All custom resource control, all custom resource controllers live outside the controller manager. That is correct, yeah. I think I'm understanding my client. <laughs> I think you are too, Shahar. Um, it is true that it's as you add more and more controllers, you definitely have uh, you, you definitely have to think about that resource constraint, right? If you um, if a bunch of those controllers are owned by you, consider a shared informer or a model like a shared informer. There is some caching in the API server, so it's not a complete wash. But yeah, if you were very inefficient about you know 
controlling like if you had a model instead of where where you where instead of you instead of providing a controller at the top that was interacting with the API server, you moved that controller logic down to the edge that was where that where resources were being changed. Obviously, that would increase the number of controllers that you have because they would each be responsible for some subset of things that they cared about, and that would mean that the pattern for that would be incredibly inefficient. So yes, it's a very good point. You are understanding it. QC protection. So all these metrics are here, and they're all exposed by things like the um, Q state metrics and that sort of stuff. What is on the one, two, seven, zero, zero, one port, though? So I want to use dash dash cert dash dash key. Dash E. Certificate and key. Let's take a look at the code here and see if we can determine what that is right away. So on port 10257, the controller manager 10257 is the secure port on which to serve HTTPS. I don't understand that at all. I feel like something changed here. I have to investigate how. Oh, let's see. Oh, dum, dum, dum. I wouldn't say they're less scalable. I would. I would say they're less, slightly less scalable. Controller word time package has access to all manager leader election stuff too. So if you want to make your own custom controllers be more efficient, that's true. Cube Builder and Operator SDK both run, build on controller runtime. They pretty much use the same patterns as controller manager, which is true. But for those shared informants to really be useful, you'd have to have. Um, multiple control loops or reconciliation loops associated with the same, right? And so typically in the operator pattern, you have like one pod running that operator per operator pattern rather than a single pod that is able to manage the shared informer across multiple of those patterns. Like you're not going to, generally people, generally speaking, people aren't going to put the etcd operator and your Postgres operator in the same pod, right? So. All right, cool. So this is the secure port. It's kind of blowing my mind that it's tied to 127001 um, and that the metrics endpoint is bound to all zeros. So I think that's a bug. I'm going to have to figure out. I feel like that's an issue. It's a really interesting grip. Controller manager.
bizarre that the secure port is bound to localhost and the insecure port is not. That don't make no sense. All right, I'm gonna look into that. Um, that might be how Kind configures it. It's kind of wacky though, but let's take a look at the Kubernetes. Kind kubidm.com. The control plane, advertise address. No, it's, it's not adjusting any of that. That's all the defaults right now. Gonna have to look at that. That's bothersome. The only thing we're enabling in the controller manager is this. I thought that this, yeah, that's buggy. All right, well, thank you. And uh, I'm gonna open that ticket because I feel like that's pretty weird. I feel like the secure port should be the one that's exposed. Or maybe, if I remember correctly, it might be because it might be related to the fact that like previously the metrics endpoint was available unauthenticated and then we like made it so that it, because of the information leak we made it so that it could be hidden behind a secure port but I don't think that we ever I'm not sure that it like it became the default to serve on a secure port I thought that it had like in 113 so I'll have to go back and look but thank you all so much for your time I'm sure that was right that's what I thought, but maybe it's a 115.3 thing? It's kind of blowing my mind. Anyway, I'm going to dig into it. I am, but not right now. But right now I'm going to go, and I'm going to enjoy my, my awesome weekend, and I think that you should do the same, because it is going to be a beautiful weekend. So... Thank you, thank you, thank you. I learned stuff in this episode. You learned stuff in this episode. Why don't we have a controller for config maps and secrets? What what do we need to modify in those config maps and secrets that we would need a controller for? Um, thanks for the awesome talk anytime. It's been super fun. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, that's a good point. Well, so kubectl raw is kind of interesting. kubectl get. Get raw. Actually, get our session kube system kube controller manager dash o vm grep self. So if you have this path, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with raw. So kube kettle get raw. Boink. Proxy metrics. It's not wired up that way. Anyway, um, yep. Sorry, you're right. I'm here. I'm talking about it because I was going to sign off, and then I got all distracted. Yes, the um, kubectl get raw is really interesting. If you have the self link API, then you can actually interact with uh, resources. Like here's an example of kubectl get raw, real quick, just so we can leave that on a good note. Let me get back to the screen face. Boop. All right, clear. If you do kubekit, I'll get raw metrics. What this is going to do is it's going to pull the metrics endpoint for the API server, which is actually pretty interesting. And you can do things like grep objects. And you can see um, a TD. And we'll see the. There's this great table that this thing presents that I've used to troubleshoot clusters a number of times. This will be my parting shot for the day. Grip objects. There we go. Entity object counts. So you can actually interact with the API server. It'll be one of the API servers that you're interacting with. It may be different. 
because it's a load balance endpoint, but typically they will all agree on this output, right? Because this is actually the number of objects that are known inside of SCB listed by object type, which is really cool. Like this is a really neat table. I really like this one because you can do things like how many certificate signing requests are there? What are the cluster, you know, how many configs, config, config maps are there? And this is cluster wise. Like this is actually super useful information to kind of like understand how the API server understands what's happening inside of um, Kubernetes or has, has those resources that are stored by the etcd. And, it, and as you can tell, it actually does include CRDs. It's not just those native resources. It's any resource that's been defined against the API is exposed. And it's like super, super, super cool. So, all right. Thank you very much. And again, enjoy your awesome weekend. I'm going to go enjoy mine. Uh, I have some great plans. I just recently celebrated my 14th wedding anniversary. And so finally, my wife and I are going to have some time this weekend to get out and enjoy that and uh, celebrate each other. So thank you very much. And I'll see you next time. And if you're coming to KubeCon, I'll see you there. So have a great weekend. Thanks again. Oh, I got to go back to the title. Okay. Bye.